let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thine sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, speak, Lord, so that men may hear and understand. Speak so that lives may change and your name may be glorified. Now, Lord, you and only you know what you have called me here to do this day. Ask that I may sit down so that you may stand up. Ask that I may hush up so that you may speak up. Ask that I may disappear so that you may appear. And I will be careful to give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank God. For the bomb in Gilead. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Glory. Somebody has gone through something, dealt with something. That family couldn't help you. Friends couldn't help you. Money wasn't enough to get you through it. The only way you made it out of it is because the Lord. Somehow, some way. Somehow, some way, he soothed your soul. During the nights when you didn't know if the tears would ever, would ever stop flowing. Somehow you woke up the next morning and realized he had rocked you to sleep ushers allowed them to come in heart was heavy tired of bearing and carrying the load But then one day you could echo the songwriter when he said, my feet got light. Because he had moved the load off of you. I'm just talking about a God who's able. to give you peace that surpass all all understanding peace that guards your heart and guard your mind because somebody will testify that you've been through some stuff that you should have lost your mind But now you know him to be a mind regulator. Because he woke you up this morning, closed you in your right mind, started you on your way. You know it was nobody but but the Lord.
to these my sons and co-laborers in the gospel Minister Naylor, Mr. Morgan, Minister Donald, Pastor Simpson, as always, it's great to have you here. The officers of this fellowship, we certainly thank God for them and for them serving. Our media ministry ushers, um, who serve diligently, um, most certainly our music ministry. Amen. Amen. And our security ministry, we thank God for them as well. Amen. Amen. And especially, I'm especially thankful to have my brother here with me, uh, Marcus, uh, my younger brother, um, who's here. Um, and I thank God for him and my niece that's here with them, Kalari. Kalari had a birthday on um, Wednesday, and she's up celebrating her birthday. Amen. She Amen. 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 So I know she had a good time. She, I know her daddy has a spoil riding. Uh, and so I know she had a really good time. Just good to see them and have them here uh, with me up from Indianola um, on today. Amen. Amen. And then to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus saying it's good it's good to be here one more time God has blessed us and given us the opportunity to try and get it right and since this is a day that the Lord has made we shall rejoice in it for it and about it amen amen stand and go with me to first Thessalonians Chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. First Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 1 through, 1 through 12. We are closing out our sermon series, Fully Committed. Fully Committed. Amen. I'm reading from the New King James translation. Finally then, brethren... We urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification I'm going to read that again for this is the will of God your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those 
who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. 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 You know, I've said this several times in here, um, and I'll say it again. Um, you know, I had the opportunity um, to coach with Coach Luckett, who I believe one of the best coaches I've ever been around. Um, just his heart, passion, knowledge, and desire to do it for as long as he did. Um, just a blessing. Um, one that I feel um, should get a whole lot more credit uh, for what he was able to do at two different schools and coaching high school basketball um, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I don't say that just because he's a member and a friend. I say it because he was good. Um, and being there is one thing that we used to do um, day before the game. Uh, practice is normally um, you want it to be a little bit shorter. You want to try to cover your game plan on what you're going to do, um, how you're going to attack, how you're going to handle what they're going to do for you. So you try to get them in and out, get the team in and out of all of those things, um, moving quickly, but making sure you're paying attention to detail, but you're getting them looking forward and looking towards um, the next day, um, looking towards the game and getting the game on their mind um, the day before, because if you wait until it's game time, then you're already too late. And so typically the day before practice, as practice is ending, um, what good coaches do, they begin to go through special situations, um, getting the team prepared for special situations, out-of-bound plays, um, um, end-of-the-game um, plays that you have to run to get a shot. Um, this is the shot that um, you're going to get. This is the play that you're going to run. You begin um, to run through um, plays if it's for last second, um, how you're going to get a shot off in the last second. So you begin to go through those things, and you want the team going through, moving quickly, but being detailed, being sharp, and you're watching um, how they go through and how they handle each in every situation, you're looking for them to find their rhythm and to find their groove. And you want to make sure that whatever you do, that they end every situation on a made basket and not on a missed basket. What you're really looking for, you're really looking to see if they are locked in. You, you want them locked in before the situation ever get there. So when the situation arrives, they are ready to deal with the situation because they've been locked in since the day before. Is it possible that we go through some of the same things over and over again in our lives? that we have to run some of the same plays and scenarios back in our lives. Is it possible that God is trying to get us to lock in? Is it possible he's trying to get us to lock in so when the situation get there, we are already prepared for the situation because we've been locked in for a long time? Is, is it possible that God wants us to be ready to win, to be ready to experience victory? Is it possible that God don't want us taking life as it come, but living life as we should? So no matter what comes our way, we are locked in on the playbook of God and because we have the playbook of God we know that we have a better coach than anybody else have and we know that his playbook guarantees victory 
As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 8 when Paul makes it known to us that we are more than conquerors. Meaning we are super conquerors. We are super victors. Meaning that we have already won, but we got to stop putting ourselves in losing positions. It says we got to get, we got to get locked in. And, and really, really Paul writing um, um, to the Thessalonians, really all he's saying to them is stay locked in. That's, that's, that's really what, it, what he's saying to them. Be careful. Don't fall off your game. Make sure that you stay locked in. What, 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 what am I saying to us this morning, church? Make sure that we what? Stay locked in. Make, make sure we stay locked in. Let's make sure we don't fall of our game. When we are fully committed, we are locked in all of the time and not locked in some of the time. See, see, see Sunday is not only our only lock-in day. We are locked in Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday because we don't know when the big game is going to break out in our lives. Paul is telling this church, telling this group of believers, whatever you do, stay locked in. That's, 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 that's what he's telling them and what I'm saying to us on today. Whatever you do, stay locked in. I mean, the songwriter said it like this, time is filled with swift. With swift transition, you don't know when things are going to change. You don't know what the weather is going to look like on tomorrow. Life is unpredictable, but it's one thing that we can count on is that God is with us if we what? If we stay, we stay locked in. Well, what does staying locked in mean? Paul, Paul lays it out here. Paul, Paul lays out some real-life issues and real-life situations that the church was dealing with back then and that we are certainly dealing with right now. <laughs> the fact that we have to deal and talk about this now, um, as well as Paul was talking about it back then, says one thing to us. There is nothing new under, under the sun. Y'all not hear me here because I'm trying to tell you about staying locked in. You should stay locked in because if it worked then, it'll work. It'll work now. Y'all hear me? Y'all hear me in here? So, so, so what does lock in mean? Um, locked in means, locking in means stepping out. Locking in means stepping out. I, I mean, it's right there in the text. It says, this is the will of God. Your sanctification. In other words, what the Lord is saying is you got to step out of the world. You have to live in it, but don't be of it. Are y'all hearing me in here? This is God's will for our lives. That we be separated out. That we should not look like the world. We should not act like the world. We should not sound like the world. It's, it's his will that we be sanctified, meaning we step out. Locking in means stepping out. You have to know God's will for our life, and you have to know your work in life. 
See, when you know God's will for your life and you know your work in this life, you separate from some stuff. You learn to establish limitations. And you learn to eliminate cheap imitations. It was shocking to me. It was shocking to me that when talking about sanctification, the first thing that Paul starts with is sexual immorality. Y'all see that in the text? Out of everything else that he could have dealt with or that God could have had him to deal with, murder, lying, cheating, all of, murder, lying, um, stealing, all of those things, he started him with sexual immorality. Um, and sexual immorality here covers it all. It, it doesn't leave anything, anything out. Sex before marriage, homosexuality, adultery, fornication, and everything else outside of the sex context within the marriage relationship. Did they cover it all? You have to understand that sex is restricted to and reserved for marriage. Marriage between husband and wife. You have to understand that sex was all about procreation. When sex was instituted in the Bible, God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. God was concerned with populating the earth, but he just wanted them to have a good time while they were doing it. And we got to start being real um, here. The reason it feels so good is because what God intended it for. Y'all hear me in here? So anything outside of the marriage context of sex is considered immorality. It was never meant for two men. It was never meant for two women to be leaning and laying up together. It was never meant as an extracurricular activity. It was never meant to be a notch in your belt because of the insecurity you have in your heart. Now y'all gonna walk with me? It was never meant to be something in addition to what you already got in marriage. So it's not for your side piece or your side dude. And I know a lot of us have messed up before. All we got to do is repent. Ask for forgiveness. And let's lock in now. But all of the other places that Paul could have addressed first, he addressed sexual immorality. Right, so I had to ask myself, why start there? 
1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20 sums up why. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Here it is right here. Here it is. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immor immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Here, here it is. And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul is saying here, what he's saying here is one thing for other people to treat you bad. To treat you like you're nothing. To mishandle and misuse you. But he's saying there's, it's another thing. When you treat yourself. He, he said all other sins happen outside the body. So that, that you, you do those to other folk. But sexual sins, you do that to your, to your own self. And what he's saying, you ought not to hurt your, your own self. Are y'all in here with me? Are y'all in there with me? Paul challenges the reader, saying, do you not realize who you belong to? Do, do, do you not realize that you've been bought with the price? Do, do you not realize that you are now members of his body? Y'all looking at me funny, but y'all do know that he's writing to the church. So don't y'all look at me funny. So do you not, do you not understand whose you are? Do, do you not understand what he paid for you? Do, do you not understand that he bought that house. Y'all not, let me, let me try it like this. Right, let me try it like this. See, I don't know if y'all were raised like I was raised. But the way I was raised, my mama didn't let just anybody come to her house. I had some friends that my mama would look at and tell me, don't bring that boy in my, in my house. And I really don't want him anywhere near my house. Now, you stand out there and talk to him, but don't bring him in my house. Well, mama, he asked if he can use the bathroom. It's a tree. <laughs> that was just my fault. But, but she understood that you could not let anything and anybody in your house. 
In church, we have to start to understand that this is the house of God. Our body, we are a temple. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we just can't be inviting folk in. Watch me now. Everybody shouldn't be able to tell everybody about what your house looked like. Everybody don't need to see your house on Instagram, on, on X, formerly known as Twitter, on Facebook. Some certain parts of your house we ought not to see when you walk in church. And I don't want to hear, well, you ain't got to look. You ain't got to wear it. You got to stop inviting some other stuff and then asking some folk, well, why did you come in? Because you left the door open. You have to establish some limitations and you have to eliminate cheap imitations. I know what the world says. I know that the world say that all this stuff is all right. I, I, I know that the world says it's okay um, not to have to declare what gender you are. I know that the world says that it's okay if you identify yourself as a girl even though you are a boy. You, could, you should be able to use certain bells. I get all of that. I know that the world says that there's nothing wrong with you getting some before it's time. Oh, y'all don't want me to talk today. See, y'all don't want me to say it in here, but you want me to let these kids go and hear it out there, and then I got to deal with them coming back in here, liking girls, liking boys, not knowing who they are, falling for any and everything, because y'all don't want me to talk and tell the real in here, but we need to talk and tell the real in here, because I'm tired of losing my young people. I'm tired of losing my young people. Because we won't have the conversations that need to be had and were supposed to be had in church. We can't begin to imitate the world. And I see us imitating the world. Churches that are now affirming. So if you're going to affirm that, what are you going to affirm next? We can't imitate the world because the world wants to be its own God. The world wants to set its own standard. The world wants to say that the Bible does not matter. We cannot imitate the world. Paul goes on from sexual immorality to begin to talk about lust. And see, when we hear lust, we immediately relate it and equate it to what? To sex. 
but it's a whole lot of folk lusting after a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with sex. Are y'all hearing me in here? I, I mean lusting after material things, lusting after emotional things. I, I mean lust can cover a whole lot of stuff. So Paul says you got to get your lust under control because lust will make you defraud a brother. Lusting after money will make you kill your brother. Y'all not hearing me in here. Commenting stuff will make you act like somebody other than a child of God. So Paul says you got to get that stuff in check or you will begin to treat your brothers and sisters the wrong way. First John 2, 15 through 17 says it clearly. Why we should not, why we should not imitate the world. It says it clearly. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of, of the Father. And I know y'all think I take the fun out of everything. But I'm not trying to take the fun out of life. I'm trying to get us to have fun in a different way in life. Your social media pages should look different than somebody that don't know the Lord. Because Paul is telling them, don't y'all start looking like the Gentiles that do not know the Lord. Do you know that when people... Look at your social media pages. They are drawing an idea about who you are based on what they see. And I don't care how much you say this is just for entertainment. Then entertain yourself some other way. He said do this for those that are on the outside. Because somebody that don't know God could be watching you who know God and they are going to determine what they do based on what they see. I was planning to be done by now, my fault. So, so, so locking in means stepping out. We got to step out some stuff. But then locking in means stepping down. We got to step down from some stuff. There's some stuff we got to retire from. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul, Paul says, seek to live a quiet, quiet life. So, seek, seek to live a quiet life. And, and, and basically he says to him, don't be a busybody. He, he basically says to him, Mind your own, your own business. Leave everybody else business alone. You're so busy in everybody else's business that you can't tend to your own business. The Bible is teaching us here that it's time for you to retire. We got to retire from some stuff. We got to step down from our job as a busybody. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Watch this. Watch what Peter says. But um, 1 Peter 4, 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matter. That shook me up, bro, because he categorized a busybody in the same breath as a murderer, a thief, and an evildoer. He put it all together because if you are a busybody, sooner or later, you're going to start some mess. Sooner or later, you're going to sow some discord. Sooner or later, you're going to cause some division. Sooner or later, you're going to carry a lie somewhere, and that lie is going to start to live, and it's going to hurt somebody that's innocent. Sooner or later, when you are a busybody, if you look at the text, Paul begins to tell them to work with their own hands. He said, but he's basically saying to him, if you get busy with your hands, you won't have an opportunity to run your mouth. Y'all, 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 y'all hearing me? If you get busy with your hands, you will not have an opportunity to run your mouth. The reason we can't get busy with our hands is because we're too busy running our mouth. I just, I got, I got a, just a sneaky suspicion that you will get more done if you say less. If you shut up, your productivity will pick up. Hush your mouth on the job. Stay at your desk. Stay in your area. Look, look, I'm going to say don't move on. I'm, I'm, I'm really done. I'm going to say don't move on. <laughs> I saw something and it's true. You can call and talk to some folks all day at work. But they won't answer the phone for you when they get home. When they should be working, they talking. Y'all know folks like that? We'll talk for three hours and then get off the phone with you when it's their lunch break. Our productivity will pick up when we learn to do what? Shut up. Locking in means stepping out. Locking in means stepping down. And then locking in means stirring up. I'm done. I'm done. Listen to what Paul says here. Paul says this. You know, now y'all got to love. You, you got to love. Y'all got to love one another. See, Paul is aware that people will know that we are his disciples, Christ's disciples, by the way that we love. By the love we first show one another. Right? So that they'll, they'll know, they'll know that, that you are God's disciple, Christ's disciple, 
by the way that you love. So Paul said to you, look, you, you got to keep loving. He says, you've been doing a good job of loving. You've been doing that. He said, so I don't really have to tell you that because there's something that you got. There's something that you have. Um, 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 but I don't want you to be content in just showing the love that you've shown. It's there in the text. It's there in the text. I, I, I promise you it is. He, he says, you got to do more and more. In, 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 in other words, you got to go overboard. Paul says, you're doing a good job, but I need you to stir it up just a little bit more. Okay, let me see if I can explain it like this and then I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm done. You know, when we were planning for the fall festival, I know I get on people's nerves. I know it. I know it. I know Miss Sabrina and Toya. I, Pastor, I know I, I worked their last nerve. And then I worked the nerve after that. Because just when they think, brother, look at that, they got it, I'll go and say, okay, we, do, we need to do this or we need to change this. And I know it get on their nerve. I know it. We were planning for the fall festival. And there was already a lot of food on the menu. We were having our meeting, and I said, Toya, just seemed like something missing. And Toya trying to be respectful and not want to tell me you're doing too much. <laughs> I'm done. I, I promise you I'm done. She, she said, Pastor, but we got nachos, we got beans, we got potato salad. You know, you said you would get the potato salad, and you got coleslaw. I said, but we, we need something else. She, she said, we got all the meat. I said, yeah, but I, I'm thinking about, you know, something else. I just want to make sure that we have enough. So we picked some more sides. And I could hear it in her voice, like, this man. <laughs> Toya, Miss Sabrina, I'm so sorry. I know I work y'all nerves. I know. I know, but I love y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all don't talk about me in my face. I appreciate it. And, you know, Sabrina has this way of saying, of, of checking me without being disrespectful and checking me. She'll say something like this. Now, Pastor, you know that's a lot of food. Whoo, that's a whole lot of food, Pastor. And I say, I know. I know. Y'all just go with me. See, I come from a home where my mother always cooked more than enough. She lived by, it's better to have too much than not have enough. And so she would cook a lot when she cooked. And so what would happen, we would have leftovers. We would have leftovers. And there's a couple things that happen with leftovers. One, you can eat on them for a while. Two, you can give some away to somebody that needs it. Three, you can, I said a couple, um, three things. Three, <laughs> you can bag them up, put them in the freezer, and store them for later on. I'm going to say this, and I'm done. I promise y'all I'm done.
See, it's somebody that got their Thanksgiving greens, pinto beans, bread for their dressing, and all of that already frozen. Because when they were cooking, they said, I might as well go ahead and cook enough so I'll have it for then. And I'm done. I, I, I'm done. Only thing I want to say to you about this love thing. We have to go overboard with love for the same reason. See, we don't want to just have enough love for folk in here. That when they come in, they feel the love when they are here. We want to show so much love. And that's why we want to step up everything coming soon with greeters and um, with our ushers. We want to step it up even more. We want to show so much love that when people leave here, they got some leftover. And here's why they need to walk out of here with some love left over. Because you never know what they are going to get hungry for later on in the week. And the love that they get from us may be the love that they need to feel whatever that hunger is that they get later on. Somebody lost a loved one and heart is heavy and heart is hurting and your smile, your kind words, your taking a moment to pray with them may be the love that they need when they're sitting at home alone and they're crying and they remember what you said to them that everything is going to be all right and you can pick up the phone and you can call me, you can talk with me. Here's a prayer, here's a scripture. That kind of love will go a long way when somebody is in need. Somebody work in a mean workplace and don't know how they're going to get from one day to the next. It could be the love that you show in here that be enough to sustain them through the next week. All I'm talking about, we have to go overboard with love. It may be a child that doesn't feel loved at home, but the love you show them here may be the love that keeps them from turning to the streets to get the love from the streets. I'm saying we got to go overboard. And why do we have to go overboard? Because God went overboard with us. He went overboard with us. The testimony is while we were Yet, sinners. It says that's when he commended his love. He demonstrated his love for us. The godly dying for the ungodly. The righteous dying for the unrighteous. The sinless dying for the sinful. He went overboard. It's wrapped up in just this verse, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. The emphasis on that word, so, is not only speak of the quality and the quantity. It speaks of how much, Father, he went in loving us. Bible says that he thought it was not robbery to lower himself. Coming a servant, a bun servant, just so we can become God's children. I know we are a loving church. I'm done. I told you I was done. I know we are a loving church. But it's time for us to stir it up some more.
It's time for us to shower people with so much love that they are wowed by the way that they feel when they walk in and when they walk out of this place. It's time for them to feel that there is a church that show the kind of love that's long-suffering. The kind of love that's patient. The kind of love that say what Toya and Miss Sabrina say to me. I know you work in my nerves, but I love you, so I'm going to get it done. The kind of love that bear with you, that walk with you through your tough and your difficult situations. That's why we need people on the Stephen ministry. So when people are hurting, that they know that they have a church that they can turn to. It's time for us. As we prepare to go back home in just a few months, it's time for us to work on being the beacon of light that shine from inside the church to outside the church and light up the entire community. It's time for us to be a refuge that people feel that they can run to and be safe. It's time for us to stir up our love even more. Because just when we thought that God could not love us anymore, each and every day, he shows us just how much more he loves us. Amen. Fully committed. Let's get locked in. Let's get locked in. Let's step out, step down, and stir up. Amen.